Welcome to the debate. Um, we have had one question in the red box. <laughs> and uh, hopefully there are more questions out there. Uh, at least we, we have reasons to believe so, uh, if we should uh, measure on the, on the intensity of the discussions uh, all around the world on, on different topics related to this technology. So I thought that maybe we could start with uh, the problems, kind of internal problems uh, with the technology and the sequencing technology. And I'm thinking about the problem of incidental findings. And then later on we can go um, have a more focus on the wish now of the technology and the personalized medicine uh, and the hypes and the hopes. Um, so, um, a first um, comment from the debate. Um, it seems that uh, Han Brunner told us that maybe the question of incidental findings is not uh, as big and not as urgent as we thought it would be. That uh, the kind of facts, the empirical evidence uh, now show us that, uh, that we can handle this, that there are not so many kind of secrets that we stumble over incidentally. Um, so, so you could comment later on when I'm finished now whether that's a correct uh, understanding of, of your uh, work. And then um, Leslie Bissaker maybe changes the focus a little bit when you say that, uh, that uh, many of these findings could be beneficial for uh, the patient or the person. And if we could agree that many of these uh, findings uh, really are beneficial, that there can be no doubt that they are beneficial, uh, then uh, the question of incidental findings and the ethics of incidental findings may change too. And um, this could be illustrated in this sentence, whether we have a duty to inform, which has been the dis discussion for, for, uh, for some years now, or if we could agree upon that we have a duty to inform in certain situations, maybe we have a duty to search for call it incidental findings. They would maybe not be incidental anymore, but still that we have a duty to search. And the next issue of the American Journal of Bioethics will actually uh, devote a complete is issue to this question. So it's an issue in our time. So the question to the panel and, and to all of you is, do we have a duty to inform or even more, do we have a duty to search for incidental findings? And maybe the patient will expect that we do. Um, and just a final question um, on this topic, and this uh, question is actually from the red box, uh, saying when you have a patient with an exome sequenced, uh, should the individual, uh, whether it's a person or patient, be informed about carrier status for a recessive disease? What do you think about uh, the kind of status of a recessive disease uh, with regard to uh, informing the patient? Uh, so I would like uh, maybe the, the panel, uh, as well as the audience, to, to, to start to deal with this uh, topic first now of incidental findings and some of the comments here. Han Brinner, maybe you would start. Is it correct that, did you really say that this problem doesn't seem to be as big as we thought it was? Yes. <laughs> would you like me to say more? Uh, I could ask, do, you, do we need more studies in order to confirm uh, that yes? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what we did. I think it's very important to contrast our approach and that, with that of less. And I think you, you put it very well there. Uh, and it's about the duty to inform, which I think we all subscribe to. We think there is a duty to inform certainly of things that are medically relevant. That's the conclusion we came to. And in practical terms, it's, I think it's the conclusion that our patients come to. If we give them the information, they will say, you did the right thing. They don't say, that's wrong. They may say, I'm not happy, I'm confused, I'm, I'm hurt. But they don't say, that was wrong. In the end, they will say, you know, thank you for this. It's not good news, but thank you. All right? So that's the duty to inform. But the reason we're not finding that much is because of the way we chose to search. 
So we're not doing a full, we're not spending 100 hours on each exome trying to find every little piece of worrying information. Our incidental findings are incidental findings. We're, we're focusing, really focusing on the question, the medical question. Uh, and therefore, uh, we only find a little bit, all right? I think less, less's approach is more, much more inclusive. You are actively looking for incidental findings. Therefore, in a similar number of exomes, you'll find lots and lots more, okay? So that perhaps that means that by the time our tools, and, and Lynn has been talking about VAST and other bioinformatics tools, if they become much more professional, then the number of incidental findings will increase. So my comment really was about the way we are, are doing it today. It's a practical approach. So it's, it's, it, is, it is in that sense a bit restrictive. Finally, I think listening to other, because we're not, uh, there's other uh, groups doing similar uh, studies in the US especially, there's a few centers. I think in, in regarding uh, the number of incidental fines that they are uh, having, that is actually quite similar. So it's sort of the, what I described is the current standard you know, for today. If our informatics gets a lot better, and there is something out there, uh, I think by Apple, there is an, an, an app for the genome where you, as an individual, you, if you have your genome sequenced, and why not? Illumina has, Illumina has it. You can take that $999 genome, or exome, exome, exome upload that in, onto your i, whatever it is, iPad, run the app, and it will tell you there will be no doctor involved. So I think, and so I'm going beyond your question now, but I think in the future, we will have lots and lots and lots of incidental findings. But not today. All right, yes. A couple thoughts. Um, I, I like to think about if this was a meeting of radiologists and we were talking about chest CTs or chest X-rays, I can't imagine that they would spend a lot of time agonizing over whether or not they should check those chest CTs or X-rays that were done for, let's say, a rib fracture to see if there might be a, a cancer nodule there. And I don't think that's because they're idiots. I think it's because they have simply accepted that those things can be there and they realize that they have an obligation to look for them in an organized way, recognizing that m the signal to noise ratio is pretty lousy. I mean, most of them, I, had, I flew off my bike at about 35 kilometers per hour and got a chest x-ray and had several broken ribs and I had a calcified lung nodule. And so I got to participate in incidental findings. It, it, it was, uh, just old histoplasmosis. But you know what? They weren't very upset about that. They didn't have ethics committees looking into it. Uh, they didn't convene national meetings and workshops because they just deal with it. And I think we have to get to a point in our profession where we accept the notion that these variants are in these exomes, these variants are in these genomes, and this is an entirely different circumstance from what was said earlier in that we don't go around ordering tests on children that are only about adult onset disorders. Of course we don't do that. None of us would do that. But if we exome a child for intellectual disability, those variants are there just like they're there on the chest x-ray. And we need to think about going forward in a positive way and not pretending that this doesn't exist. I would ask you to do a little thought experiment and imagine um, my cohort of patients or Hans' cohort or your thousand patients with colon cancer. And you do all these exomes or genomes. And then after you're done with them, imagine gathering them in a room like this and they would sit down and then I would ask you to explain to them why it is 
that you didn't have, didn't devote any resources towards the secondary findings, that you were too busy to do that, that you were understaffed, and that scientifically it really wasn't part of what you were supposed to be doing, and so you didn't do it. And then you explained to them that 50 of you have this condition, and 12 of you have that condition, but I didn't bother to look. And I, myself, I can't figure out how I would convince those people that that was the right thing to do. I just can't do it. So I think the question needs to be behind us, and we need to look at this as something that is our future, it's our patients' futures, and it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. It's our opportunity to learn how we can do predictive medicine. <coughs> and for the most part, the data are free. And I can't remember the last time people offered us free data and we said, no thanks, we're not interested. My goodness, we should do this. It's an incredible opportunity. And every genome or exome that's done is an opportunity to, to learn how to do predictive medicine. And then characterizing them as incidental findings I also find interesting. And I'm sure, Han, you've seen this. When we make a diagnosis, if we have a child, let's say that that's the indication, intellectual disability, mental retardation. And I find some variant in some gene, and let's imagine there's two other people on this planet that have that, and the family says, oh, so what does this mean about my son? And you say, oh, actually, it doesn't mean anything because like you said, we don't understand anything about this gene. There's no treatment. It's a de novo mutation, and uh, the child's unlikely to reproduce anyway. That is the primary finding. And then we somehow have this idea that if there is a, um, a colon cancer mutation in that gene, that that's incidental and less important. And I, I don't get it because I can't do much about, as nearly as much about that kid's intellectual disability as I can about that APC mutation. And why we call one important and the other one incidental and unimportant, I can't puzzle that out. It's a, that's an enigma to me. Okay. One, uh, small, one small comment. The thing that really worries yeah. me about this is that you said you did 35 miles an hour on a bike? 35 kilometers. <laughs> Don't ever do that again. It's dangerous. I have learned that, actually. I did learn that. I think uh, Anneke may have some other perspectives. Um, well, I, actually, I was going to raise the radiology perspective because, of course, our radiology colleagues can tell us a lot about incidental findings, and they have written a lot of guidelines about how to manage incidental findings. Um, but uh, I think there's a subtle difference. We can learn a lot from that. But a, a radiology colleague finds a tumour as an incidental finding. I, and I also, just as a, an aside, I don't think I've heard anyone say an incidental finding is unimportant. I, I think incidental findings are very important. It's just we're a bit unclear as to what to do with them sometimes. Um, but the, the radiology colleague finds a tumour and it's there now and needs disclosure, treatment, whatever. The thing about some incidental findings in genetics is that it tells you something sometimes a bit uncertain about some point in the future. And it's that that I think some of us have difficulties with, knowing when to impart it. So, for example, in a research study in the UK, um, a baby had a, um, a ray CGH because, sorry, before it was born in, in, during pregnancy, uh, it had some uh, anomalies on its ultrasound scan. Uh, a ray CGH in a research setting found that the baby had a BRCA1 gene change. And the question was, when do we disclose that? It wasn't really... Um, that this is something that should not be disclosed, although in that research setting it wasn't going to be disclosed. I think the clinicians felt this is something that ought to be um, imparted, but was pregnancy the right time to do it? And then all the downstream complications of, well, maybe the mother also has it, so therefore we need to test the mother. And you know, So I, I think it's not as easy as saying, oh, actually, we, we, know, we know how to deal with this. Um, it, there is a new dimension in that it's... It's something in the future, and it may not be that certain. And, and I think I agree with both speakers that if it's medically actionable, if you've got good evidence that, you know, you, you find an APC mutation, then you've got very good evidence that you can do something about that. So that is, I agree, that's a no-brainer, certainly in clinical practice. I mean, research has all its own regulations, but if in clinical practice I find something incidentally I, that's medically actionable, 
uh, or medically relevant, then that's a no-brainer to disclose that. It's all the in-betweenies that I think is much more difficult. If I'm not certain about it, if it may not show itself for 20 years, when do we disclose it? How do we disclose it? And sort of one last little point, uh, and I hope, I, I hope you're right that we won't see genome testing in children without any reason, but there will be a demand for it, so we need, to, we need to be able to respond to that. There will be parents who say, it's my right to know what I've endowed my children with, I want to pay the $999 and see what they've got. Well, in fact, there's one interesting example of that, uh, testing the actinin gene for uh, supposed athletic ability. And parents are sending their kids' DNA in to see whether they should be playing soccer or not. Uh, so, uh, and that can be done uh, legally, at least in our country. I have a question from the audience here. Uh, it's uh, Werner Christie, it's a uh, former head of the Norwegian Advisory Board. Um, thank you, Berger. Um, I have a question pertaining to the whole concept of personalized medicine. Uh, traveling Europe and, and discussing with Americans, I sense that the P4 concept has a um, strong sort of market drive. It's a, uh, it's a very strong market push from many uh, commercial interests and there will be, of course, market pull from consumers probably to get this information. But from a sort of public health point of view, it, what puzzles me is this the right approach to deal with massive um, epidemiology, the global burden of disease, is it relevant? I can see that it's relevant for certain cancers, certain um, genetic diseases, of course, and other diseases. But why is it relevant for public health concerns? I haven't been convinced yet for certain reasons. Um, when you see the low penetration of the genes that you had through your excellent presentations this morning, indicated that there are so many genes related to many of these diseases and the penetration of each of them is very small. So the puzzle is not why do people become sick, but the interesting thing is why do we all stay healthy? Most of us <laughs> stay healthy. So the field of immunogenomics is apparently not developed yet. And why don't we focus so much more on the resilience factors and investigate why people resist all the mutations that obviously happen in our body, all the cancers that start, all the infections that we get, and very few get diseased from many serious infections. We know that from tuberculosis and a lot of others. And when it comes to metabolic syndrome, it's an epidemic that have evolved over one generation. It's obviously not genetic, and I think most of these diseases are generic and like Bernie said when he presented the ENCODE uh, investigation of all the DNA this fall, he said maybe we should focus on something we could do something with our own free will, our behavior and the environment which we have changed from the very beginning as a human species. We have engineered our own environment and we can of course improve it even further. Isn't that much easier and much cheaper for a public health approach? Much well, more easier. It's not easy. Nobody thinks it's easier. So I, 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 I'd like to respond to one, one uh, part of your comment uh, because I, 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 I think I, I would disagree that um, uh, something like metabolic syndrome or obesity, type 2 diabetes, the fact that the incidence has increased dramatically in just a generation, that doesn't mean that, there's, that genetics plays no part. It, it means that uh, our environment has changed in a way that our, perhaps our genes have not caught up with. So there, there can still be substantial genetic components, but what's interesting, I think, is to look at the gene-environment interaction. Uh, and and that, that's something we, as yet, know very little about, and something that I think nicely brings together. And I also think it's not an either-or. Um, I think we need to do both. We need to do a lot more about immunogenomics as well. Uh, you're quite right. We shouldn't be focusing just on the genetics, all the extra bits around it. Can I, yeah. can, I, can I come back to something I said in my presentation? I need to know how many Norwegians? Eight million? Five. 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 <laughs> <laughs> He's disappointed. Come on. <laughs> all right. So uh, if there is... <laughs> there, there are eight million But there are Swedes, five million wonderful... <laughs> No agents. Okay. That means that there is roughly 300,000 people with a rare disease in this country. Most of those are genetic. Most of those are not these low penetrants. They are highly penetrant single 
Mendelian genes. And again, based on, on data from other countries, probably less than 50% of those have ever been diagnosed. So that's, not, that's a public health problem that we can address with exome or with any sort of sequencing technology. That is real. It, but it's not P4. It's only P1. This is the part, I think the rest of it, even though I, I think uh, Ronild had a, a fantastic plan for cancer, I think that is exactly where uh, we should all try and go in other countries that are less organized. I think that's a real advantage of Norway, that you can organize this on a national scale. That's fantastic. And it will produce results, and that's the entire P4. But my talk was about this admittedly minority. You know, it's the 6% of the population <coughs> let's say 300,000 Norwegians. I mean, that's several football stadiums. It's not insignificant. I think we should, that's the immediate, for me, that's the immediate application of this technology. The rest, and I think that just, but I'm a clinical geneticist. For me, that justifies uh, using this on a fairly large scale. Now, if you're not interested in single gene disorders, you may say, no, it's all rare diseases. And, and there's a point to that too. I mean, that is the thing about, what about the common diseases? I'm not, talk about the common disease, but I think the rare diseases by themselves justify taking this very seriously. Would you come in? I could comment on yeah. that. Uh, uh, I was almost going to say the same thing because the cost benefit from the cancer perspective is a little bit easier to see, right? So um, the cost benefit for the patient, of course, uh, that the one does not get the treatment they should not have to uh, not have the side effects they don't want to have unless it's actually beneficial for them, but also for the health system, at least for the new drugs, which are really expensive to know which patient should have them, of course. But if we are successful in doing that in our country to actually sequence the tumor primarily from thousands of patients, um, we do also have the normal DNA sequence because that's the control. And although we are not looking for these incidental findings, the database and those data are there. And obviously, on a population scale, they are interesting to look into. So at some phase, that will come up as uh, some sort of discussion. And we know already that um, some genetic variants, not necessarily predisposing to a disease, but normal variants, um, also contributes, for instance, in the patient's response to certain therapies. So even for the individual case, it could be important to know some of the changes. But for now, that will be too hard to implement. But the data will, not, will be there. So that will be a debate, I would guess. Let's take a new question from the audience over there. 